One of the great problems which faces us today, we go into any bookstore, turn on the television, look at any of the mass media, is the subject of ESP, extrasensory perception. And of course, the term parapsychology, and PSI, and PK, and all the rest of the terms which have derived from this particular so-called science of analysis. Now, for us to understand it and come to grips with it, what we have to do is, first of all, define some terms. How many have your Bibles here tonight, incidentally? Good. We're going to need those. And if you have a tape recorder or if you have uh, paper and pencil, you're going to need this to take some notes to give you some background in this area. First of all, what do we mean when we use the term ESP, extrasensory perception? Well, extrasensory perception, and I am quoting now from the Encyclopedia Man, Myth, and Magic, extrasensory perception, by definition of Dr. J.B. Ryan, who pioneered in this, is the reception of information by anyone through means other than the senses, close quote. What that translates to is that we are receiving data through means other than the normal channels of information. That is extrasensory perception. Now, what is PK? When you hear somebody say, uh, what is your PK experience? And you run into this sometimes. What does it mean? Well, it refers to psychokinesis, which is the capacity to move solid objects by the exertion of mental forces against them. What do we mean when we talk about the three types of ESP that Dr. Ryan defines? There are three types. I'd like to give you what these three types are because they are all grouped under what is known as parapsychology. And parapsychology, by definition, is, and I quote, psychical research. Parapsychology is psychical research. Para in the Greek means alongside of. Psychology means the study of the psyche or the soul or the spiritual facility, sometimes known as the mind. What we're dealing with here is parapsychology or psychical research. All of this is grouped under one heading and it is known as PSI. That's the technical name. You'll find it in all the books and all the studies in all the monographs and scholarly reports. Now there are three types of ESP. There is clairvoyance, there is precognition, and there is telepathy. Now let me explain what each one of these means. Clairvoyance, according to Dr. Ryan, is the ESP of objects or events. That is the capacity to understand objects and events which are transpiring over a long distance. You are aware of what's taking place over a long distance. You are receiving impressions of this, the ESP of objects and of events. Secondly, precognition. That is, knowledge of events not yet taken place. This may be days, weeks, or months. Sometimes it can be projected into years. This is the second type of ESP, precognition. Thirdly, telepathy. Dr. Ryan defines this as direct experience of someone else's thoughts. That's what we're talking about. Direct experience of someone else's thoughts. The capacity to read the mind or to grasp the significance of thought patterns which are in various individuals' minds. Now, we know that dreams are sometimes the vehicles of ESP, according to the research which has been done. And ESP and the things connected with it are not new. The basic research for extrasensory perception, for PSI, for psychokinesis, for all of the things which I have been talking about here, began in the 1880s. It did not begin in the scientific laboratory. It began with the evaluation of mediums and of spiritistic phenomena. The roots of ESP in the laboratory lie in the kingdom of the occult. This is where the exploration first began. In fact, it might be well worthwhile pointing out 
that in 1882, the Society for Psychical Research was founded in London to investigate, quote, psychical and spiritualistic claims, close quote. In France, around the same time, the Institute of Metaphysics was formed, and later the American Society of Psychical Research. There were resultant studies that took place in telepathy at Harvard University, Stanford University, and the University of Groningen in Holland. These things all took place in the 19th century, and they were investigating telepathy, investigating clairvoyance, investigating psychic phenomena, which was associated with spiritism and spiritistic mediums. One of the greatest spiritistic mediums of the 19th century, Eusepia Palidon, was actually photographed levitating a table and levitating a stool, and we have those photographs today that she did in the 1880s. The photographs were done under clinical circumstances, her hands being held and her feet being held, and the table levitating 8 to 12 inches off the floor. I've seen these photographs myself. They are unimpeachably authentic. This was the beginning of psychical research. In 1927, Duke University, with a large grant, began under Dr. William McDougall, professor of psychology, the analysis of extrasensory data. The two people who became famous in this were J.B. Rhine and Louisa Rhine, his wife. They are not psychologists. They are biologists. And the thing that most people do not know about the Duke University work is that it was not begun with the idea in mind of exploring normal ESP and the things which are now being done in many places. I'll give you the real reason it was begun. The studies at Duke University were begun for the purpose, I'm quoting now, to confirm survival after death, not extrasensory perception. And the people they first began to investigate were mediums and psychics. It was only then that they moved into, after this, that they moved into cards and electronic tests and all kinds of things connected with scientific measurements. So let's understand something at the very beginning. The vaunted studies of J.B. Ryan and McDougall and of Duke University had their roots in the kingdom of the occult. All of this stemmed back to the 1800s, to the 19th century specifically, to psychical research through the British and the French institutes, and eventually surfaced in the United States as a scientific experiment to find out whether or not the spiritual nature of man or the mind survived the death of the body. They were not looking for telepathic communications. That was well established already. In fact, before the year 1933, Dr. S. G. Soul, a London psychologist, had under exacting test conditions demonstrated telepathy, that it is possible to know what is in somebody else's mind even over a long distance. And this had been done repeatedly to show that it was not only a possibility, but a fact. The Duke University studies and the university studies that began in the United States into the world of extrasensory perception were begun with psychic phenomena, mediums, and the kingdom of the occult. And the people who are today talking about this being a new science had better wake up to the fact that the new science came into existence as a result of people attempting to penetrate beyond the grave and to find out if they could communicate with anybody two biologists and a psychologist and a large grant to back it up. Now this, of course, is not generally known to the Christian public and to the public in general. In 1934, the first monograph on the subject of extrasensory perception was published. It was called Extrasensory Perception, quite appropriately. And today, 
We have all around us books on extrasensory perception. I have with me, I brought with me about 15 or 18 of these books. It's just a sample of it right here. How to make ESP work for you. Here we have volume 7 of Man, Myth, and Magic. There's Dracula on the cover. Very charming picture. And inside you have an analysis. A whole section on J.B. Rhine, the occult, and extrasensory perception. All of this material spelled out, including the electronic tests, the Rhine tests, all of the correlation data to show how they went about it scientifically, the clairvoyance testing, the testing of precognition, the use of mind over matter. And here are two of the prints, which you can look at afterwards, of the photographs taken of Eusapia Palandino elevating a table and elevating a chair. Now there's levitation right there. This all became part of psychical research which led to the study of extrasensory perception. It's also interesting to note that the Russians are now pursuing extrasensory perception with a vengeance. Here's a picture from the Soviet Union, a series of photographs of a lady possessed of ESP capacities. And she is attempting psychokinesis, which is concentration upon material objects in order to move them by forces other than the material. And here you see a whole uh, group of small wooden tubes. Here you see the tubes beginning to move under the photographs. Here you see the tubes being grouped together. She has not touched any of these things. And all of this is being done by a Russian scientist and by a group of Russians now in various Russian universities because they are fascinated with the effects of ESP. In a book on extrasensory perception behind the Iron Curtain, which is today available in paperback form, is a fascinating account of the development of the science of parapsychology in the Soviet Union, which does not believe in another dimension of reality, but is rapidly getting some shock therapy because things are happening for which they don't have any real scientific explanations. One of the most interesting things is the notation that the Russian experiments on ESP began in the late 1920s at Leningrad University under V.M. Bachtarev. I can't pronounce Russian too well, but that's his name. He began the studies. Today they have a whole program on this. In this book published about ESP, Behind the Iron Curtain, there is an interesting analysis given of one man in the Soviet Union who has defied all of the tests that they have put before him. He has the unusual capacity to enter a room of individuals who know him and by an act of will make it impossible for anybody in the room to recognize him. He discovered it during World War II and it saved his life two or three times from the Germans. But he has the capacity to cover an entire room with some force unknown to physics or to science so that people who worked with him, including the scientists, could not recognize him when he entered the room, didn't know he was there. And when they were asked to give accounts of who he was, they all described varying individuals, but all of them missed him. And that was an experiment they repeated. I recall when I was a youngster back in the Neolithic age, <laughs> before television, that goes to show you how far back the Neolithic age will go. There was a radio program called The Shadow. <laughs> Today they sell tapes on the subject. You're dating yourself. <laughs> you laugh, you date yourself. I bought this uh, record of The Shadow programs to take home to my children so they could hear what Dad used to listen to. And I put it on. And about five minutes into it, my kids turned around and said, For real, Dad, did you buy this jazz? <laughs> that was the end of my grand experiments to acquaint them with the shadow. But in the shadow opening, 
it describes Lamont Cranston as a man who had the power to cloud men's minds so that they could not know him. Lamont Cranston is alive and well today in the Soviet Union. There is a man that does have this power, and he's demonstrated it to Russians and non-Russians. We also have something that's driven some of our Russian colleagues a bit up the walls of the Kremlin, and that is the fact that there exist in Russia at least two ladies who blindfolded and cut off from all sensory data can read a book through their fingertips by merely passing their fingertips over the type they are able to tell what the type says. And since your fingertips are not connected to your optic nerve, and there are no lenses, no cornea, no iris, no part of the eye known to exist in the fingertips, it has terribly upset the Russians. Because they must pass their fingers over the writing in order to translate, and they do it blindfolded. I've seen pictures of it. That's upset the Russians terribly. I hope it upsets them a lot more, simply because it begins to show just what kind of things begin to occur when the unopened door is opened. Now, I want to hurry on and point out some interesting and, I think, tremendously important facts about ESP itself. There are types of ESP, as we have talked about, but I'd like to talk about normal ESP versus occultic ESP. Now, there are two different kinds beyond Dr. Ryan's classifications. And I am making my classification on the basis of the scriptures and the basis of human experience. Dr. Ryan has ignored the scriptures in his classification. Therefore, he has missed a whole area of information. First of all, Normal ESP is the capacity to know an event while it is in process. Now, that's important. A person can know an event while it is in process and have no connection whatsoever with the occult or with religion. Now, there are numerous cases of this. There are people that have the capacity to know events that are going on at that very moment, and they themselves are not present. Let me illustrate. I was preaching in a large camp in New England a couple of years ago, and I was on the subject of the occultic phenomena of our day, and afterwards a lady came up to me with her husband, and she was visibly shaken and very pale. And she said, you frightened me very much. I said, well, if it'll keep you away from the occult, uh, I'm happy. She said, no, that isn't it. She said, I've had an experience that I've got to tell you about because I don't understand it. I said, all right. And I checked into this lady. She's the wife of a member of a local evangelical church. She herself is an evangelical Christian. No connection with the occult whatsoever. She said, I had the strangest thing happen to me. She said, just about five months ago, I was lying in bed. I may have been asleep. I may have been dreaming. I don't know which. But I became suddenly aware of the fact that my father was desperately ill. He lives in Switzerland. And, she said, I suddenly could see in the room, as clearly as if I were there, the interior of a hospital room. I could describe the room. I knew everything that was in it, and I saw him in the bed. And she said, I heard the doctor and the nurse talking. And she went on to describe the things which had taken place at this particular time. She said, I immediately went to the telephone and tried to place a call. She said, when the call got through, my father was indeed in a hospital. He had been taken there for emergency surgery, and his condition was critical. They did not know whether he would live. She said, I had no way of knowing that. I knew nothing about it. And she said, I wrote them and told them what I had seen and heard. Her father lived. And she said, I described the room to my father because he didn't believe me. And she said, the one thing that didn't 
make any sense in what I saw or experienced was glass doors behind the bed. And she said, I never saw anything like that before, and I had to describe it as glass doors behind the bed. She said, they wrote back and said, everything that you have said, including the position of the furniture in the room, is absolutely accurate. But there are no glass doors behind the bed. She said, there's got to be something there. Describe what's in the room. And they wrote her back again and described the back wall. What she had seen was portable shades. You know, in our hospitals, we have a ring that goes around the bed with a curtain that operates, and you just pull the curtain around and the person can't be seen. In this hospital room, they had a folded type of glass partition which was placed behind the bed, folded up. And when it opened up, it came around the bed. Those were the glass doors behind the bed. She had never seen anything like that before, so she could only describe it as glass doors behind the bed. When she did explain this in the next letter, that threw everybody, including the nurse in the hospital room, into a pack simply because of the fact that nobody could have known over 3,000 miles away the design of the room, the position of the bed, the way her father was facing, and even described the nurse who came in, what color hair she had and what she looked like and what kind of clothing she had on, and she had never seen a Swiss nurse before. And she said, what is it? She said, it scared me to death. What we are dealing with here is what has been called normal extrasensory perception. The capacity of an individual closely allied to another person's mind receiving somehow or other the sensory data and the information in that person's mind and that being accurately transferred to them. Now, this is normal ESP, and if it happens, don't get shook up, because it has nothing to do with the occult. Now, there are people right here in this room that have had experiences with normal extrasensory perception. They have known something was going on. They have felt something was happening, but they couldn't put their finger on it. How many people have ever had that feeling? And how many of you found out later it happened? Something was wrong. But well, you see... We are dealing here, right in this room, with what is known as normal ESP. This has nothing whatsoever to do with the world of the occult. It is a latent sense, probably in all of us, but more thoroughly developed in some of us. Now, if any of you have seen the Kreskin program on television, you are aware of the fact that Kreskin claims no occultic or supernatural powers. As the Scotsman says, they have me do it, it. <laughs> but nevertheless, what he is talking about in terms of latent ESP is very, very plausible and very, very possible. Supposing it is true that we do have the capacity to know an event while it is in a process of occurring or the state of an object connected with this happening. Supposing we do that. And we have nothing whatsoever to do with anything occultic. The only possible explanation is there is something within us in the undeveloped latent capacities of the human brain and mind which works. And this is a normal explanation of that type of phenomenon. And secondly, there is telepathic ESP, a second type of normal ESP. No connection whatever with the occult. That is the capacity to know right at the moment what is in somebody else's mind. And to be able to accurately write it down. And have an enormous degree of accuracy. You say, oh, now, come on. You're talking about... Uh, Mind reading, you're talking about the capacity to actually look into somebody else's mind. Do you really think that's possible? It's not only possible, it happens. 
There are people who are marvelous sending sets. They transmit electrical energy. And there are people who are marvelous receiving sets. They get it. And when you put those two people together, you get some positively fascinating results. Let me give you an illustration of ESP telepathy documented to the hilt. And this is a documented case, and therefore uh, it should prove of great value to us. In the fall of 1937 and the spring of 1938, the opportunity was provided for me to test the powers of telepathy through a series of experiments in long-distance telepathy with the Arctic explorer Sir Hubert Wilkins. At that time, Sir Hubert had been assigned by the Soviet government to outfit an expedition and fly north from New York City in search of a crew of a lost Soviet airman who had been trying to fly nonstop from the Soviet Union over the North Pole to the United States. This plane had been forced down some 200 miles this side of the pole. Its radio had gone dead, and the Russians, thinking the flyers might still be alive in the Arctic wastes, had instituted the search for them. I met Sir Hubert as a co-member of the City Club, and he had told me of different unexplainable premonitions he had had throughout his life, stating his conviction that the greatest unexplored area yet left to man is the area of his own mind. This mutuality of interest led to the idea of the telepathic experiments. Sir Hubert suggested he would keep mental appointments with me three nights a week, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, from 11.30 to midnight Eastern Standard Time that he would synchronize this difference in time as he flew further north. He would be the sender. Acting as the receiver, I was to sit quietly in my study at the times designated and make my mind receptive by a technique I had developed through the years of private experimentation. I would record such impressions as it came to me. It was through, it was thought wise to arrange for unbiased observation of my recordings. Dr. Gardner Murphy, then professor in the psychology department of Columbia University, agreed to witness my material. Since the tests were not being conducted in the laboratory, he could not evaluate them as a whole. But when the five and a half month series of tests was concluded, Dr. Murphy testified by affidavit that I had, quote, methodically sent to him each night by mail, protected by government postmark, copies of all impressions I had received. Other witnesses were Dr. A. Strathgordon, brain surgeon for the British government, and he lists six or seven other good witnesses. When the experiments were concluded and checked against Wilkins' diary and log, it was found that of the hundreds of impressions recorded during the test period, 70% of them were accurate. Now think about that. Here is a detailed, controlled experiment, five and a half months in duration, under the observation of a psychologist from Columbia University, protected by the male so that there could be no possible collusion or deception and only 30% of the impressions received over thousands of miles were inaccurate. 70% were corroborated from the diary of the man who sent them from the notes of the man who received them. We are dealing with what is known as telepathic communication. At that hour of the night, under those circumstances, Two minds were that close together, time and space being irrelevant. The documentation is irrefutable. I can't spend the time here giving you 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 documented cases like this, but I assure you I could. You cannot gainsay the fact that there is such a thing as telepathic communication and that it is normal. This has nothing to do with the occult. Now, the man who did this was Harold Sherman, who has great qualms about some of the occult phenomena and has done a lot to blow up the myths of the occult when they've tried to masquerade as fact. 
He himself has some peculiar views, but in this area, his documentation is irrefutable. What are we learning? Two types of normal ESP. The capacity to know an event while it is in process. Secondly, a telepathic capacity to know what is in another person's mind at the same moment. I think that's what Kreskin does. I think he has honed his natural and normal abilities to such a fantastic state of concentration that he quite accurately latches on to the mental pictures that people paint. That's what they are. And he's able to read them. Since he disclaims any occultic phenomena, and we have no way of proving that he's connected with it, we may have a genuine example of normal telepathic ESP. Now there is occultic ESP. And let's deal with that. Occultic ESP is in three types. Precognitive, psychokinetic, and medium trance. Let me describe them and point out what the difference is. Precognitive, occultic ESP is the capacity of a person to know an event before it takes place. That's precognition, to know before the actual event. Now, there is only one way this can be accomplished. The thought must be embedded in somebody else's mind, and that not being the explanation. Then we are dealing with some other source of information communicating data. That's what we're into when we deal with spiritism, when we deal with theosophy, when we deal with the reincarnationists, and we deal with people who are involved in the Eastern sects and those who are addicted to the pursuit of psychic phenomena. Parapsychology is really psychical research. And parapsychology is therefore terribly dangerous when it gets into the area of precognitive, psychokinetic, and medium trance. The moment it hits these areas, you are dealing with forces outside this dimension because only a supernatural force can predict the future. Because only a supernatural force can make an event transpire. Secondly, psychokinetic energy done by a medium, done by somebody involved in the occult, for the purpose of stimulating faith in occultic phenomena and getting people to support occultism is very common. The capacity to move an object from one place to another is a startling thing. I was talking just today of all things that happened to me today. I happen to be a great health enthusiast ever since my days in college when I boxed and wrestled and swam and went through all the calisthenics that are supposed to keep you in good shape. Uh, I've always been addicted to some type of exercise and trying to keep yourself in shape. Therefore, I am a charter member of the European Health Spas. And I spend a lot of time trying to keep in reasonably good shape. Well, you know, of all things today, I am in a spa getting a massage. And the man who was massaging me says, what are you lecturing on now, Dr. Martin? And I said, I'm on the subject of occultic phenomena and psychokinetic energy. And I thought that would shut him up for sure. <laughs> he said, great. He said, I'm into all that. I said, you are. <laughs> he said, yes. And then he began to describe to me all of the things that he was interested in. I mean, yoga, meditation, all different types of things. And one of them was in psychokinetic energy. He said some friends of his and himself decided one night to play with the Ouija board. 
And he said, we had a fascinating experience with psychokinetic energy. I said, what happened? He said, well, we were playing with the board and asking it questions. And the spirit that was controlling the answers answered us that it was able to do things to prove that it was genuine. So we all decided we would ask the spirit to do something that we could visibly agree on. There were six or seven of us. So we asked the spirit to levitate a table radio by psychokinetic energy, which is to concentrate on the radio and to utilize our combined power of faith in this spirit's ability, and then up would go the radio. So we took it as a lark, and we all looked at the radio intensely, concentrated, held hands around the Ouija board, and just stared into the face of that radio. And he said, you know what happened? I said, no. He says, it came up off the table. I said, it did? He said, it sure did as that is my witness. And it floated off the table and across the room about six feet from where it was. And we all got so scared, we let out a yell and it smashed right onto the floor. He said, we lost one radio with psychokinetic energy. So we know one thing about psychokinetic energy. You have to concentrate to sustain it. <laughs> now, this is occultic energy. You see what I'm talking about? They didn't even know what they were dealing with. You can sit and concentrate on radios and flags and chairs from now till purgatory freezes over, and I guarantee you, none of them are going to levitate. No way. But you get involved in an occultic experiment and you jolly well can have it happen. And it inspires fear, respect, and fascination. And that is one of the great tools of the Prince of Darkness. Fascination with the unknown and the mysterious. So in the world of the occult, there is such a thing as precognition. People who can look ahead and tell you that something is going to happen. Well, what's an illustration of precognition? There are many illustrations of precognition. The false prophets who have given prophecies throughout human history have had some remarkable fulfillments of these prophecies. If you study comparative religions, you will find prophecies which were alleged to have taken place and they saw these things before they occurred, and they took place exactly as they were supposed to have taken place. Yet the individuals who were doing the prophesying were not believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ, nor were they grounded in the Judeo-Christian religion. Where were they getting their sources from? There's an interesting book by Stuart Robb, who lives here in California, whom I've debated many times on radio on the subject of Michel de Notre Dame or Nostradamus. And Nostradamus said that he was a Christian. A Jew converted to Christianity. You read some of the prophecies of Nostradamus. You find fantastic amounts of things that describe fishes of steel destroying ships and all kinds of predictive prophecies of things in the future. And yet Nostradamus himself was woefully lacking in his theology. He was not evangelical, and he was not winning men to Christ with what he was doing. He was simply fascinating people. If you go back into the history of prophecy, and there are numerous books written on this subject. In fact, the Encyclopedia Man, Myth, and Magic catalogs so many of them, it would take quite a bit of time just to review them. Of prophecies that were made that came to pass. Of spells that were cast in prophecies by those who practiced witchcraft. And it happened precisely that way. But what are we to do with these things? Are we to believe it? The scripture gives us great reason for understanding the fact that false prophets can make prophecies that Satan makes come true. We looked in our last lecture at Deuteronomy chapter 13. You will notice there 
that the scripture says if there arises a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or a wonder and it comes to pass the way he has told you what is the next thing that comes from him he seeks to lead you away from the Lord your God what is the goal of all false prophecy to lead us away from biblical authority and from the authority of what God has said to human experience notice this all parapsychological research all psychical research in every area of PSI is grounded not in revelation but in what experience that's very important and experience is dangerous unless you have some criterion for measuring the experience that is why the Christian says to the law and the testimony if they do not speak that is if they are not in agreement it is because there is no light in them so let's keep those thoughts in our mind as we study occultism and let's look at the biblical evaluation of the entire thing and this I think will help us understand it we are told that there are biblical parallels to ESP just as there are biblical parallels to other things which the psychic phenomena people wishes to believe one of the greatest illustrations we are told is found in John chapter 11 if you turn in your Bibles to it we are told that John 11 indicates that Jesus was a master of ESP Well, let's find out precisely what they're talking about because you're going to be confronted with this sooner or later and you ought to know it now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus verse 5 when he had heard therefore that he was sick he abode two days still in the same place where he was then after that he said to his disciples let us go again into Judea his disciples said unto him master the Jews lately sought to stone you you're going there again Jesus answered are there not 12 hours in the day if any man walks in the day he stumbles not because he sees the light of this world but if a man walks in the night he stumbles because there's no light in him these things said he and after that he said to them our friend Lazarus is asleep I am going that I may awake him out of his sleep and said his disciples Lord if he's asleep that's good for him Howbeit Jesus spake of his death and said Jesus unto them plainly verse 14 Lazarus is dead how did Jesus know that A certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany the town of Mary and her sister Martha now Bethany is removed from Jerusalem about a mile Jesus was removed from them a mile he deliberately would not go near them and he announced to his disciples that Lazarus was dead how did he know this well say the people who are interested in extrasensory perception he knew it because he was the master of ESP he received the impression of Lazarus's death and he knew it now they cite another illustration the Lord Jesus Christ and the Pharisees Matthew chapter 22 verse 18 let's take the illustrations which are used so we can analyze them Matthew 22 18 now these things are valuable to us because the people who are involved in this cite them we ought to know what they are tell us therefore what you think master verse 17 is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said why do you tempt me you hypocrites show me the tribute money verse 18 Jesus perceived their wickedness and in another place the Lord Jesus Christ specifically said that he knew what was in their thoughts again ESP and he knew not he needed not that any man should what tell him anything about man because he knew what was in man this is all cited as extrasensory perceptive data how do we answer this all right the answer is very clear it's found for us in the 12th chapter of the Gospel of John John chapter 12 I think what we ought to do is 
memorize some of these passages. So when people come up against us with it, we'll have a quick answer. Verse 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believes on me does not believe on me, but on him that sent me. He that sees me sees him that sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whosoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. He that rejects me and receives not my words, verse 48, has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same will judge him at the last day. Look at verse 49. I have not spoken of myself. The Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Who was the source of Jesus Christ's teachings? Who was the one who gave him a commandment on everything he should say and everything he should teach? God the Father. Therefore, Jesus did not have extrasensory perception, normal or occultic. What Jesus Christ had was supernatural information that came to him through the power of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Acts chapter 10. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, who went about doing good and healing those who were what? Oppressed by the devil, Acts 10.38. Remember our Lord said something else? Think about this for a minute. I by my own self can do nothing it is the Father in me. He is doing the works. So Jesus Christ wasn't operating on ESP, clairvoyance, telepathy. Jesus Christ was operating as the last Adam anointed by the Holy Spirit and communicating information given to him by God the Father. Therefore, the passages which they are using have no bearing on the subject whatsoever. Once we understand that, we have no problem. My Father gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And the thing that impresses me most of all about this whole problem of ESP and parapsychology is the fact that so many people seem to be swept into it without recognizing that there is a deadly parallel. And I want to give you this parallel because most people miss it since they don't do research in this area. In this encyclopedia, Man, Myth, and Magic, in the article written by J.B. Ryan, there appears one of the most revealing statements I have ever read on the subject of parapsychology, which is really, as I have shown, psychical research. Listen to it. This is Ryan now speaking. There is, of course, a great deal more to religion than the mere basis of exchange, the modes of interaction. But what has come to be called the supernatural, the miraculous, and the transcendent in religion is much the same as the types of capacity that are now the subject of study in parapsychology. You grasp what he's saying? What you consider to be the miraculous and the supernatural from God is in reality psychical phenomena. He is saying the same thing the spiritists say and the same thing that the occultists say. Only he's doing it from the platform of Duke University as a biologist involved allegedly in scientific research. He goes on. He says, the parallel is rather impressive. All the types of PSI are present in the theological system. Now notice the deadly parallel. Precognition as prophecy. Clairvoyance as revelation. Telepathy in prayer. And the answer to prayer through physical miracles as psychokinesis. What's taking place? You've got to watch it closely. It's a quick change. Everything theological has been replaced by occultic terminology. So that what happens is that prophecy, which does not come by the will of man, says the scripture, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit 
prophecy is really no more than some type of precognition, just knowing something in advance. How you know it is really immaterial. Clairvoyance is revelation. The capacity to know something going on about objects and events really is a revelation to you. So the prophets who got revelations from God about things that were going to happen immediately or might even have been happening right then, these were their revelations. I bet you never knew before that the book of Revelation itself was a clairvoyant record given by the Apostle John. It would come as quite a jolt to the Apostle John, too, I'm sure. Telepathy in prayer. In other words, how do we pray? Well, actually, we pray in telepathic communication with the great unknowable what in the great somewhere. We're back into our cultic mumbo-jumbo, hardly scientific information. And finally, answers to prayer that take place, even healing itself for the body, is a result of what? Psycho kinetic energy. And this is what the psychic healers say. There's healing in the occult, healing in Christian science, healing in spiritism, healing in the meditation movements. That's why people flock to these things. They're healed. Of course. Where does it come from? Well, of course, it comes through contact with the great, unknowable, impenetrable, creative, cosmic force of the universe. And you're in contact with this how? By PK, psychokinetic energy release. And when you are healed, this power has been released in you, and mind force has overcome matter manifestation. It is not a question of God reversing the course of nature, disease as the result of sin being healed by the power of a loving father. Instead, it's the same occultic terminology for psychic phenomena all over again. I think that that parallel ought to be burned into each one of our minds. Precognition is equated with prophecy. Clairvoyance is equated with revelation. Telepathy is equated with prayer. And psychokinesis is equated with answers to prayer involving what we would call miraculous movements of matter or energy. Now the mask is finally off. Parapsychology itself, according to Rhine, is in reality psychical research. Psychical research is grounded in mediums, in the study of occultic phenomena, and in the movement of the 19th century revival of modern spiritism and the study of the occult. It has been lightly sprayed with scientific terminology and the phenomena which is revealed has been tested by scientific means, which is supposed to communicate the idea that we are not dealing with the occult, we are only dealing with some form of manifestation beyond our senses. But the truth is we are dealing with the domain of Satan, and that the moment the door is unlocked, all these things come charging through into our realm. It is not for nothing that the scripture says that Israel was deprived of her land because she followed the practices of the occult. And I want to close with an emphasis on that so we don't forget just how dangerous this can become. I'd like you to look for just one moment at the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 19. Excuse me, 18. When you have come into the land which the Lord thy God gives thee, you shall not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, that uses divination, that observes astrology, 
who is an enchanter or a medium, a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits, a male witch, or someone who tries to contact beyond the grave. The science of parapsychology began at Duke University in 1927 in violation of Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 11, an attempt to go beyond the grave. It has produced the whole world of parapsychological research in an attempt to validate satanic manifestations by scientific means. This is lethal to the human soul, and the Christian must be aware of it. Verse 12, For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. All these practices, these occultic phenomena, are what? Abomination. What is a diviner? Somebody who foretells the future. What is a necromancer? Somebody who tries to find out from somebody who has gone beyond this realm what's happening. God understood parapsychology before Duke University ever began to investigate it. And he said, stay away from it. It's dangerous to the soul. There's a very interesting little book called Prison to Praise by Chaplain Merlin Carruthers. Nestled in the middle of this book is a fascinating incident that I want to share in drawing our lecture tonight to a close. Carruthers was marvelously redeemed by the power of Christ, became a chaplain and a great witness for God. Filled with the Holy Spirit as a young Christian, he went about trying to live an exemplary Christian life. What happened to him is worth noting. Listen to his testimony. I returned to the United States in 1963, went back to chaplain school for six months and was assigned to Fort Bragg in 1964. Here I continued studying hypnosis with renewed vigor and got involved in the spiritual frontiers movement led by Arthur Ford. Arthur Ford is the medium that contacted James Pike's son, Jim Jr., who's supposed to have committed or supposed to have contacted Pike's son the one who committed suicide, James Jr. I had heard that many ministers were drawn to this movement. They are. In Arthur Ford's home, I saw first-hand evidence of the workings of a spirit world completely separate from our rational world. I was fascinated. But was it scriptural? Nagging doubts in the back of my mind. The spirits were unquestionably real, but the Bible speaks of spirits other than God's Holy Spirit and talks about spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible calls these spirits our enemies, Satan's own forces, and warns us to test all spirits to be sure we aren't being manipulated by the enemy. Satan can cleverly counterfeit the work of the Holy Spirit. The goal for us, they taught us, is to become like Christ in all things, since we are also sons of God. I travel many miles to talk with people who knew something about the subject and studied books on hypnotism, spoke to doctors, and even wrote the Library of Congress. I didn't know I was on dangerous ground, subtly but surely. I had begun to look at Jesus Christ as someone much like myself, someone I could be like if I tried hard enough. My faith had become damaged and seriously undermined although I didn't know it yet. The change was so subtle. Perhaps the fine line was crossed when I found myself talking about Jesus as teacher and miracle worker and failing to mention that he died on a cross for us and that his blood cleanses us from sin. The subtle danger of the so-called Christian spiritualist movement or the spiritual frontiers movement is that it would lead men to try to copy Christ and appropriate spiritual, appropriate spiritual powers for themselves, and so commit the original sin of Satan, the fallen angel, who wanted to be like God himself. Carruthers has given us good counsel. Even the discerning Christian who is pursuing God avidly 
can be led astray and have his faith undermined if he does not keep his eyes glued to the authority of Scripture and not to the constant siren of experience. God warns us, Thy word is truth. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Test all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Parapsychology and occultic ESP are two of the things we should test as spirits of the Antichrist.